everyone. So uh, Mr. Penn has a degree in aerospace engineering uh, from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Um, he's worked as a system engineer at the Jet Propulsion Lab and at Lockheed, Mar Lockheed Martin as a team manager for flight systems. Uh, his career path has also led him to the medical device field where he's worked with GE Healthcare, uh, Baxter and cardiac science. So he has experience in product development, MRI scanners, pharmaceuticals, and even AED machines. Uh, so Tom has a breadth of experience uh, across a lot of the engineering field, um, but has um, expertise, especially in aerospace. So I'll let him take it away. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. Um, you can either put them in the chat or um, kind of just unmute uh, and ask. Hope you enjoy. Thanks, everybody. Um, thanks for joining this morning and for having me. Um, can everybody hear me okay? All right. Um, I, I do need to apologize. I, um, I had a last minute problem where my computer was like doing a big Windows upgrade and basically was out of commission all morning. So <laughs> So I'm, I'm working from an old set of charts, but it's not really about the charts, but you will see some things that are, I call them anachronisms, you know, we's and they's and the, us, because I did this pitch with the Chicago Engineering Foundation outreach a few years ago with another person. And um, so I, I just had to quick get all the automotive stuff out of it. So anyway, alrighty. So what I'm gonna do, um, uh, the guy said I should talk for about 20 or 30 minutes and then we can spend time on questions. So I'd like it to be as interactive as possible. Um, so let's see. Um, let's get started here. So, you know, just a general overview from the prior pitch. You know, I can talk about this, but I, I don't intend to talk about it uh, in any detail. But aerospace engineers work in the aerospace field, air, aircraft, spacecraft related items. Other engineering, uh, uh, you know, um, specialties specialize in other things, and I'm pretty familiar with them because you don't usually work with just aerospace engineers. You're usually working with a variety of people, even when you're in a big team environment. Okay, so one one point I want to make about the aerospace industry is um, everybody thinks that it's you know it's SpaceX, it's helicopters on Mars. Wait, are you guys seeing my whole? You're seeing my whole screen. You're not seeing all the see video. That. Good. Yeah. Okay. So, and, and that that's what it is. Those are what I call the big wowies, the, the big attention getters. And, and in fact, that's what I did in my career is, is uh, Mars exploration and a lot of space stuff. So that's, you know, it's, it's a really interesting part of it. But what you have to know is that space is like 5% of the employment in the entire aerospace industry. Okay. So aviation and defense make up 90%. Uh, or more. And so that also includes, remember, that's not just engineers. So if you've got an airline, you know, you've got flight attendants, you've got maintenance people, you've got baggage handlers, you know, but that's broadly in the in the industry. Um, just a couple of things to be aware of is two huge uh, aviation and, and aerospace companies are based in Chicago. So Boeing, it's got a building right downtown, United Airlines, Miss <coughs> United Airlines is, is based in Chicago also. So there's a lot of aerospace um, that, is, that is headquartered in Chicago. That's not, not really relevant because they're mostly, you know, headquarter buildings. But um, just so you know, you know, that's the, that's the kind of center for all that. Um, just a couple things if you want to follow up. There's a group called the AIAA, American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. That's the Aerospace Professional Society. You can probably join at any age. I don't think there's a, a limit. Um, and, and that has, they have a monthly magazine and it's just, it's the place where all the technical papers for aerospace are, are written. And then there's a magazine called Aviation Week and Space Technology. That's kind of the sports illustrated of, of, of space and, and aviation. Um, you know, see if your library at school has it or get it at the library. It's, it's really interesting. It follows the industry and tells you exactly what's going on. And they often kind of break stories on secret projects and stuff. So it's a, it's a pretty cool magazine. <clears throat> okay, I often get a, questions about kind of day in the life of an engineer. You know, what is it like? What can you expect? Um, and I'll just summarize this really quickly. Um, there's multiple roles in engineering. You probably think that you'd be, you know, 
doing analysis, uh, you know, doing equations, things like that. That is one role. It's called an individual contributor. That means you're the person who's who's designing things and, and giving out products like that. Um, but then there's a lot of organization and management that has to happen in big projects. So pretty quickly, you get into team leadership, you get into program management, general management. So there's, you know, none of this stuff is done by a, per, a single person. Engineering is a team sport and it takes a group of people to do it. And technical management is actually a technical field. It has its own tools. Um, and that's what I've done is pro program management and, and, and business management. In the early years, you're usually kind of a doer. Um, and then in your middle years, you decide whether you're going to take a technical path or a, or a management path. Um, and then in the late career, you know, you, you do what I'm doing, which is you work with other people, you hire and fire people, you develop talent, you, and you mentor people. Okay. Um, Let's see, I'll talk about product development versus R&D later. So that's that's a pretty important one. Okay, so my story. So um, I was born in Arlington Heights, so Chicago suburbs, same as you guys. Um, and then I moved to Decatur, which is central Illinois when I was 10 years old. Um, I was always interested in science and model rockets. I've still got one that I built, you know, when I was about 12 years old. Um, and I still launch them sometimes. Um, so I always had an interest in science and, and model rocketry and stuff. And you have to remember that when I was born, it was, you know, I, I actually saw the moon landing. So that was, um, you know, a big, big impact on everybody. Everybody was thinking about this in those days. And then the space shuttle and all that kind of stuff happened. So um, I used to spend a lot of time outdoors. I make and make and break stuff. I, I think it's important to do hands-on stuff, you know, um, try things out. I had a chemistry set, I had tools, I would take apart electronics. It's just, just a curiosity about the world um, helps make a good engineer. <clears throat> and then um, I spent 14 years in the aerospace industry and I'll get into that in detail. And then I, uh, and then I went into medical device uh, and medical product development, which people think, some people think is like a big change, but it turns out it was fairly easy for me. Okay, so my early years, I went to university. I'm just going to skip over these pretty quickly. You can you can read these, but I uh, went to University of Illinois. Football team was actually pretty good then. Um, then I got my first job, and this was really formative. So the Jet Propulsion Laboratory is is Disneyland for space. Okay, these are the people who make the helicopters, the rovers, and all that kind of stuff. So. Um, it was a dream job and I really loved it. Uh, they treated me really well. Um, I traveled a lot. I worked on small projects that nobody else wanted to work on. And I was the only guy. So they'd be like, you need to fly to Washington, the headquarters and see this presentation, you know, stuff like that. So like, lots of opportunity. Um, and so I'm gonna go into that in a little more detail. Um, the pictures here, some of these are stock pictures from the internet. But every picture here is something I actually worked on. This is not just, hey, it's glitzy. These are things I actually did. So um, I worked on this shuttle payload for a couple of years. Um, I worked on a thing called Solar Probe, which there's actually one flying right now. Um, I worked on solar sails with a private uh, volunteer group. I worked on the early Mars rovers. We'd go out in the desert with the with the scientists and they'd tell us what they wanted us to do, worked on these, uh, these electronic thrusters, ion thrusters, which, which are used today. So lots of cool stuff. Um, then I worked on a real flight project. So this is Mars Observer, <clears throat> which was a, a satellite built by a private company for JPL. And they wanted somebody to go out to the company in New Jersey and, and work with the engineers there and go through launch and operations, which is what I did. Um, we were in Florida when Hurricane Andrew hit, which was a really, which was a category five hurricane that disrupted us a lot. It's a little too long a story to tell, but, uh, we did, we did ultimately launch the spacecraft. Um, it ultimately was a failure <laughs> and then they built another satellite and, and basically replicated the mission. Um, but that was a big, uh, a big event in my life. Um, and then there's a bunch of stuff that I was working on 20 years ago that just is happening now. So you've heard about the Mars rover, you've, you've heard about the comet lander a couple of years ago, and then Pluto. 
you know, that was that was just a glimmer in everybody's eye at the time. Um, but it's finally done it. So then I had to make a big change in the in the early in the late nineties. Um, uh, what happened was the industry was was rapidly uh, consolidating, and basically Lockheed and Martin Marietta uh, combined. And the company I was working for actually we missed the whole thing in here, which is that I also worked on commercial satellites for four years. Um, but the industry changed, and a lot of the people from uh, this place in New Jersey went to GE Medical in Waukesha. And so, um, so I went with them. So they had a big leadership team. It was the head of the business. And then he brought a bunch of people over and basically rebuilt the engineering team. So I was there for 10 years. Um, let's see how much detail I got in here. Oh, I got lots of detail. So I worked on a, on a, a MRI scanners. I worked on magnets and, and then got into a couple different uh, business acquisitions. So, um, first thing we did was this open MRI. So open MRI was a big, uh, fad at the time and we we came up with this really unique design that would allow you to make it as open as possible but still have a good enough field strength there's a there's a conflict in magnets if you either want it open or you want it strong it's hard to have both and so this is a attempt at the compromise of the both um, that was a really big project super high uh, visibility you can see on the right hand side you know we had the we had the big booth at the Oh, and Jack Welch came to see us and it was it was a big time. Um, and then after that, I went over to England for a couple of years um, and worked on superconducting magnets. Um, so this is a three Tesla magnet, which is a huge magnet field. Um, and um, like I said, I'm trying to not, not spend too much time on it, but that was a really interesting assignment. And this is a picture of the first time it made three Tesla. Um, these magnets, what, what's bending out of here is helium. They're cooled by helium and, and cryocoolers. Um, what happens, what used to happen with these magnets is that they would, um, they call it quenching. The, the magnet, magnetic field, something would heat up inside just a tiny bit and the whole magnet would go from superconducting to not superconducting. And you would blow like $20,000 worth of helium out into the, into the factory. Um, we redesigned this magnet so that wouldn't happen. And so, you know, it saved tons of money on, on development of the product. And then I got one, I have one patent and this is the patent I got for that magnet or I was a code, code inventor. So that was kind of fun. Okay, so um, this is kind of a summary and then I'm gonna go on. Oh wait, I've, I've got kind of a, I've missed a few things here, but um, look, en engineering is a hard major, but it's really worth it. I traveled a lot. I, I, I've been to China, I've been to India, I've been to Malaysia, you know, Singapore, Europe, all over the place. Um, it's really been fun. Um, engineering in general is a, is a high paying job and, and it's, it's continues to be, and there's always a shortage, especially for women and underrepresented minorities. So that's, that's there's tons of opportunity um, and tons of scholarships. Um, and then, you know, you guys are probably in the, in the application form. So get, you know, get good grades and write good essays. You know, you want to stand out. And then getting scholarships, I assume you guys have pretty good resources for that. One thing my daughter taught me is um, once you get into school, there's often more um, scholarships available because a lot of people just do it before they start, you know, go in freshman year and this is what it's going to be but they don't realize there's still money available. And some of that is not available until you're already in a, in a, uh, a program. So there's, you know, there's a lot you can, you know, you can pay your way through college with scholarships, okay? Okay, so that's the end of my charts. Cause as I said, I got truncated by, I wasn't able to really glam everything up the way I wanted to, but um, I did want to talk about product development. Well, I'm gonna talk a little bit about aerospace engineering itself. So, um, so what makes it different is it's 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 kind of kind of kind of a fundamentals type thing. You learn in general. You learn you take a lot of math because that drives everything. You take a lot of physics. Um, you take aerodynamics, which is different than most other um, you know majors take. Um, you know hydraulics and things like that are really subsets of aerodynamics. They're just a different way to do the equations. Um, you typically do structures. So structures are involved in spacecraft and aircraft, obviously. Wings and stuff are really specialized structures. 
And then you have a lot of what I would call dynamics. So you do uh, orbital mechanics and you do control systems. So control systems can either be electronic control systems or they can be physical control systems and aerospace uses both. So usually in your, in your core curriculum, you have structures, uh, aerodynamics, dynamics, and then you also have propulsion, be it aircraft or spacecraft, and you typically have materials, metallurgy, things like that. So you understand that. Obviously computing and modeling is important and kind of goes along in parallel. So it's really good to go into a, a degree like that with a good background in coding. I personally am the world's worst coder. I don't think I ever made a program that actually ran and gave an output, but I got through it and I've run teams of people, you know, writing software. So I learned something along the way. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about product development versus what you call R&D. So everybody uses the word R&D for research and development. Almost nobody does research anymore. You know, it, all this stuff is development work. Even Lockheed and those folks are, are not doing that much research. Um, it's just, you know, just, just to be straight with you. Um, it's mostly development. So there's a difference between what I would call engineering. So if you're gonna build a bridge or a, you know, um, aircraft carrier or a dam or a building or a spacecraft, a one-off spacecraft like this dart. Did you guys see the dart thing that hit the asteroid a couple weeks ago? Um, that's a one-off product. It takes a lot of engineering, but you can throw money at problems and you can just brute force it. You know, if there's a problem, um, it doesn't have to be easy to use. It doesn't have to be serviced. You're not going to go up there and repair the thing. You know, obviously buildings are a little bit different, but the, you know, the, the, the point is in a project like that, you usually are given a specification. You say, I'm going to, I want a dam that crosses this, this, you know, this particular gap and it's this tall and it holds this much water and it runs this many turbines, you know, so you, you know, the specs, you can write them down and there's usually a sponsor that you'll tell, tell you that, and then you go and do the project. In product development, <clears throat> I guess an example I would use, this is a somewhat local example, but I think you guys are familiar. Um, are you familiar with Milwaukee Tool? You know, all the hand tools they make. So I don't know if I have any around, but um, I know a bunch of people at Milwaukee Tool. They're at, they actually have a design center in Chicago that they're opening. So um, that's, a, that's a good place for internships. Um, Milwaukee Tool has to, you know, when they make a product, they have to, they have to have spare parts. They have to have a battery that works interchangeably with other products. You know, they need to make sure their boxes fit on the shelf in a certain way, you know. That, so product development, you're not given a spec. You have to figure out what you want that product to be. And you have to think about what they call the product life cycle. So there's you know, there's the introduction of the product and you get it out in the field and then you have to teach people how to use it. And then you have to sustain that product and make spare parts. And then you have to go to end of life. So are you just gonna make that thing obsolete or are you gonna make the battery shape live on for 20 years and make the drill change? Or it might be smarter to do the opposite since batteries die every few years, maybe make your drill perpetual or make the whole thing throw away. You just have to decide. But product life cycle, you know, this is where the idea of supply chain comes in. Everybody's heard of supply chain, right? Well, supply chains, um, you know, I'll give you, I'll do the, I'll finish my, my career description uh, and, and talk about supply chain. So um, the thing I did after, after GE, so this pitch really just went through GE. Then after that, I went to, to Baxter and I worked on um, infusion pumps and disposable um, medical products. Um, so they make, they make infusion pumps for saline solutions, things like that. And then they also make um, drugs and, 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 and related products. Um, and so after that, I went to a company called Cardiac Science, which makes AEDs. So are you guys familiar with AEDs, the defibrillators? Any of you been trained on that with, uh, yeah, with, uh, you know, <laughs> with uh, chest compressions and all that. Um, so there's a number of companies making AEDs and, and cardiac science is one of them. 
Um, the company was was uh, bought in a, a, uh, a bankruptcy sale from the court. And this company, it's called Private Equity Company, bought it. It's basically a company that buys companies. And they then had to hire a new leadership team. And so they hired a guy as a CEO, somebody I've worked with, chief operating officer is a person I worked with. And then I went in to run um, program management and engineering. Um, so this is an example of a fairly simple device, but our supply chain was kind of interesting. We had plastics that came from a Saudi company that had factories all over the place. We had an electronics board that came from um, came from, I think it came from uh, Singapore, Malaysia. And then we had parts that came from all over the place. And so when, when you know, we got a bunch of tariffs and disruptions about five years ago, you know, you wouldn't get your orders and your customers wouldn't get their products and you couldn't ship your, 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 your stuff. So, it, you know, that whole idea of supply chain is very important. And I had to go several times and go to suppliers and work with them um and the medical device stuff is is built a little bit differently it needs extra controls and things it's very similar to aerospace actually so um that's where the whole idea of the supply chain came com, comes about um but then what happened was this company we built it up and we sold the company and then it was absorbed into a company called zoll z-o-l-l -L. so um, that's where cardiac science is today and that's what allows me to be here today so um so in terms of <clears throat> kind of my canned presentation, that's, that's what I've got. Um, let's see. I have a question if you wouldn't mind. Sure. Um, how did kind of the connection form between the conventionally, um, you know, what you might think of the more traditional um, aerospace field, you know, like your work at NASA, um, how did the connection form between that and your work with medical devices at GE? Because Kind of to me, that doesn't seem like a perfectly. Um, it, it demands an explanation to me. I think. <laughs> so I'd I'd wonder how that how that happened. If you could no, say. that's good, and it, it it wasn't really as complex as I thought it would. But, you know, hearing it, you go, "Wow, that's really different." You have to realize, um, I didn't get, I didn't go straight from aerospace into Baxter. That would have been a really big change because Baxter makes little tiny gizmos that are plastic tubes, pouches connectors. In my opinion, it's boring stuff. It's interesting from a management and organization view, but the products are boring. You know, the pump was an interesting one, but that, that's another whole story. What I did was I went from aerospace, which is systems engineering and technical management. Then I went to GE, GE Healthcare. Well, an MRI scanner is really complicated. It's a lot like a radar system. So it's got real-time software, it's got really dangerous magnets. It's got um, high power electronics. You know, it's, it's got uh, application software to manage all that. It's got image processing. So it's, it's actually kind of similar to aerospace in terms of complexity and, you know, uh, high technology stuff. I mean, you know, you're working, you're working these gradients that, that are, you know, like I said, it's like a it's it's like the combination of a of a radar system and a sonar, you know, ground penetrating thing. It's it's a complex beast, and so we took aerospace um, systems engineering approaches to the MRI scanner. Number one and number two, we had a bunch of people who'd already worked together. So when we sat there as a as a business team we we didn't have to understand each other's culture because we knew that we all came from the same place. So those were two things that made it an easy, uh, easy transition. The other thing is the things I did in aerospace, I worked, I was a systems engineer once again, which means you tie everything together. You don't know, you're not an expert at anything really, but you're an expert at knitting things together. So I had to be able to understand DC power, AC power, electronic components, harness and wiring, you know, um, uh, radiation shielding, you know, so once you deal with enough things and enough different, um, enough different uh, disciplines, you know, medical's easy to be honest. Medical, medical equipment is not really that high tech. It may seem super high tech, 
but the companies are actually fairly um, fairly conservative about their engineering. They'll tell you how how high tech it is, but <laughs> it's not. So does that answer your question? Yeah, no, that definitely does. The thing about the MRI machine makes sense. It's very complex. So well, the other thing, the other thing that was cool was so then I went to then I went to magnets. Well, these superconducting magnets, I showed you some pictures. That's a really weird technology. You got to get it really cold. It's all cryogenic. I actually used, I called up my old aerospace buddies on a, one of those magnets. And um, he helped me, you know, teach the thermal engineers how to keep the magnet cold. You know, he said, oh, well, we've got ways to do this. We use carbon fiber and, you know, you, you do it this way. And so we, we took aerospace technology and used it in the magnets. So that's kind of a, a, a way that it was, that, that, that we tied these things together. Also like these x-ray tubes, they're 150 kilowatts. That's like, that's like super high power, you know? Um, but, you know, we were used to dealing with high power. So it, it wasn't that big a challenge. Yeah, I've, I've kind of heard how the different fields, um, the, the lines between them are kind of blurred. Have you found that to be true in your experience? Uh, yes, I find that the lack of blurring is more likely somebody. Um, oh, I see a question here. Why do you make the magnet cold? I'll answer that. Um, I'm sorry. So the question was blurring. Um, you know, hold on, just note. You know, it, it, a professor at, at, at Illinois used to say, he always used to say, let's go back to first principles. So this guy would, would be doing, explaining something really complex. And he would go back to F equals MA, V equals IR. You know, your equations always go back to the same basic stuff. Um, and people who, who pretend that things are really specialized and really different software people do this all the time. Some of my best friends are software people, by the way, but software people act like it's different and act like it doesn't need to be designed and act like it doesn't need requirements. And some of them think it doesn't need to be tested. And so that's just, that's just, um, that's not really right. You know, engineering is a, is a, is an approach that, that works regardless of what the thing is that you're working on. So question about the magnet, why is it cold? Okay. So superconducting, when you run a current through a piece of metal, a wire, typically there's resistance, right? Especially when you have lots and lots of wire, there's always some resistance. You measure it with a voltmeter or a, you know, ohmmeter, right? So with um, these superconducting materials, if you, certain metal combinations, if you cool them down cold enough, and this is like four degrees Kelvin, so four degrees above absolute zero, that's what the temperature that helium liquefies at, um, at that temperature, the metal has zero uh, resistance. It's super weird. It's on, this has only been around for 50 years, maybe. And when that happens, you can run, you, you run up a magnet, you, you, you charge it up and get current in the coils, and then you pull the wires off, and it just keeps going forever. The magnetic field is stable almost forever you know, as long as you keep it cold. So that's the whole point of cold is it's called low temperature superconductors. The, the magic trick would be is if we could get high temperature superconductors that would work at room temperature because cooling things that cold is very expensive. You need helium, you need pumps, you need electricity. It's, it's a big hassle. Um, but that's why you see all these big physics things with all these toroidal magnets and, you know, um, atom smashers and, and um, you know, um, fusion reactors and stuff like that are all super chilled, superconducting magnets. <clears throat> okay, any other questions? Uh, yeah, actually, sorry, I had another question. Sorry for the background noise. I know you were talking about quenching and magnets. Um, I actually worked at uh, Fermilab over the summer and still do. And some of the other people who were there, they were looking at detecting quenching. So I was really wondering if you could talk more about how you managed to get rid of that. I know that's still like a prominent problem in lots of magnets. Okay. Well, that's a great question. And I think I, think I, I just heard about the Fermi thing a, a, a couple of weeks ago, actually. And that's 
Fermi's kind of the physics equivalent of JPL. You know, it's a government lab um, and they do really cool stuff. Um, so the way these, do you, do you recall what company made the magnets by chance? I have no idea. Unfortunately, I don't. No, okay. I don't. So when I came to this, um, when I came to this company in England, the way they made the magnets is, um, here, I can actually, I'll show you pictures. Let's see. Yeah, here it is. Well, it doesn't show the insides of it very well. Um, but this big magnet, this one on the right, the bigger one in the background, that thing had a fiberglass core. It's like the bobbin or spool of thread, right? Multi layers and stuff, but that's essentially what it is. And then you wrapped wire around it and the wire is about, it's thicker than a pencil lead. It's like double the thickness of a pencil lead sideways. And then um, you wrap that around these cores and then what they did was they impregnated it in wax. I mean, this is like, in my opinion, this is like Bronze Age stuff. They put it in a vat full of wax and they suck the air out so that the wax impregnates it. And the wax holds the coil together as a solid lump, okay? So that's really cool. But the problem is as you, as you power this thing up, there's forces. When this thing's powered up, it's got like 300 tons of force going each way. So the whole thing's gotta be really strong. If two of those wires slip and, 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 and rub against each other, that'll make enough heat to quench the whole thing. All you need is a tiny warm spot and then you ain't superconduct any anymore. It becomes a resistor, it becomes a heater and the whole thing, you know, crashes. That's what it quenches. So what we did was, that's what this, that's what this uh, patent was about. We basically said, well, that's stupid to make this thing out of fiberglass. Why not make this whole thing out of stainless steel? So what we did was we, we, um, we have a much stronger substrate or spool. And secondly, we wound the thing tighter and had higher currents, slightly higher currents, about double what they were before. So if you look at a one Tesla magnet, it had a certain sort of uh, stress factor, let's call it. And if you looked at an, uh, a three Tesla magnet, it had like a four or five or six X less stress uh, factor on it because they didn't want to push it because they had all these quenches. So when we, when we sturdied up the, the core, we were able to run the whole thing at a higher stress level. So I think, you know, that would be the question, which is what I forget what the stress factor is. I think it's amp amp PSI or something like that, but you, I could figure, I could find that out, but just, just to ask them and say, who makes the magnets <laughs> on the other hand, this magnet might be way prohibitively expensive to put, you know, 50 of them in a row to make a tube, you know. Um, the other thing you can do, well, this is kind of, you know, bad, bad engineering. You can also collect the helium <laughs> and reuse it, but uh, you're just admitting you're going to have quenches, right? Um, in terms yeah, of detecting them, yeah. yeah, in terms of detecting them, I don't know how to detect them. We would hear it. You could hear the magnet. It would go, ee! Boom! <laughs> so, but uh, cool. That's cool. They got a lot of yeah, them. Probably got a, they probably got a thousand of them in there, right? <laughs> yeah, they have a lot of them. Yeah, that's why they were trying to find a way to detect the quenches because as of now, they just have like a system that's like, oh, a quench happened. How do we move forward? And then they were trying to get it so that they could detect them and then like prematurely take steps to prevent it. But this is really interesting. Thank you. Well, and look, I, it's been a long time since I did this, but there, there may be some telltale signs. You might see some fluttering in the current or something like that. But it, it, once you detect it, it's almost too late on a quench, as far as I know. Right, exactly. That was the issue, yeah. All right. Any other questions? Uh, I have a question. So I know you sure. mentioned that like you were, you were building rockets as, at like 10 years old. So you've always been interested in aerospace, but what is it that uh, made you interested, made you drawn to engineering and what is it about it that draws you to it? <clears throat> well, it's, it's been, it's always been kind of natural for me. So I, I always was interested in science. I was always reading, you know, popular mechanics and all the various books. Um, it's hard for me to say I'm good at math, but I took a lot of it. Um, 
but it was just always what I like to do. So it was, you know, I was just always drawn to the technical side of things. It's, it's kind of a personality trait. Some people are people people. Some people are things people, you know, I guess I'm a little more of a things people um, when it comes to what I like to work on. Um, but um, trying to think, you know, I, my first job was in a root beer stand, so that's not engineering. Then I worked at a place that made air bearings. So that was kind of a, you know, I was like a factory guy, but, you know, they had cool, kind of cool engineering there. Um, so I've just always been around it, always been drawn to it. And, um, you know, University of Illinois, when I was at Champaign in Decatur, it's 50 miles down the road. So, you know, I would visit there frequently and, you know, um, you know, I was just always on a path to do that, I think. Does that help? I mean, it's, it's kind of hard to describe. All right, any other questions? I think there was a question about getting in. Yeah, it looks like there's some questions in the chat as well. Um, I can okay. read them out if that's easier. Um, no, I can see asking, it. I can see um, it. Okay, cool. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so, so internships. So obviously you guys are, are connected with this, inter this high school internship with, um, uh with Fermi. So that's a good one. I wasn't aware of that till recently. Um there are summer camps, you know, University of Illinois has a summer camp. There's a group called Chai C that does uh education stuff. I think you guys are probably past that in terms of your careers. Um but in terms of companies, I guess I would just look, it's gotten so much easier to find internships and there's a lot more of them now than there were there were none when I was a kid. But um, I would just Google it. I would just say technical uh, technical um, internships for high school. Once you get into college, it's easy. You go to any company, look at their career sites, search for internships, and you'll find them. JPL's got 20 or 30 of them. Tesla's got 10 of them. You know, SpaceX has got 20 of them. Milwaukee Tools got 10 of them. It's, you know, so once you're, once you're in college, it's easy. Um, I'll look into that, I'll ask around, but I think you guys can find it as easily as me. I don't have any magic, except I do have some contacts and things, but a lot of what I do is Google, you know? <laughs> and I know you guys do that too. So I'll, I'll look into that and see uh, if there's any other high school internships that, but I thought the, I thought the um, Fermi one was amazing because that's such a high tech place, you know? People are dying to get in there as, 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 as uh, you know, PhDs. And so to get in there as a high school student is, is awesome. Uh, and also prepare for college. Yeah, I just, you know, good grades, community service. I guess the, I guess the test scores aren't as important anymore, but, you know, just be involved with groups and, and, and you know, project type stuff. I, I found that things like uh, robotics, you know, the first robotics and things like that were really good because it's a, it's a hard problem. It's, it's a well-known organization and the kids that really enjoy it, it's really fun and it, it, it teaches them teamwork. So I think first robotics is a good one too. All right, Edward, any suggestions about post-grad aerospace engineering? Uh, let's see. Not sure what you mean. Post, oh, post-grad, when you say post-grad, can you give me a little more detail, Edward? Like, uh, if you want to pursue another degree or perhaps some certificates or something like that. Oh, yeah, okay. Okay, so, um, there's lots of opportunities for that, um, and companies will often sponsor people to go back and get their master's degrees. There's a lot of master's degrees that are, um, that are online personally that drive me nuts, but oh, you can get a, you can get a master's uh, completely online. They've been doing it from USC for, for 30 years. Um, so you can get a, you can get a master's, you can get uh, certificates in specific areas, or you could get a PhD. Um, recognize, you know, there's, Aerospace doesn't hire tons of PhDs. You know, they they tend to be extreme specialists, materials, you know, nuclear physics. You know, there you'll have some specialists who's a PhD, but not tons of them. Um, 
So, um, but there's tons of opportunities and you don't have to stay in aerospace. You know, a lot of people do aerospace. They might, you know, make, uh, material science is really, um, is really uh, popular and well-paying now. The other thing is with an aero degree, you could easily get a minor in math or a minor in computer science with just a few more classes, typically, especially math. You take so much math and aero that you only need to take like six more hours and you can get a minor. So there's ways to kind of enhance your, your degree as, as you go along. And then Edward, you said, uh, talk about some JPL ones. So let's see in detail, my internet connection is unstable. Let's see. So, so this, is, this is the big one, which was the flight project. Um, what was so interesting is that this is the spacecraft being, being worked on in the clean room. I used to go there and I was in the clean room two or three times a day for one reason or another. Um, this is in New Jersey. Then we moved it to Florida and here we are on top of the, the orbit, the transfer stage. So that's a solid rocket right now, right there. Um, every, every building there has the word hazardous in it because there's something hazardous about it. So in this one, we've got basically a giant bomb we're sitting on top of it. And then the next one, we load it with toxic propellants. And then we take it out to the, out to the launch pad. And this is like 300 feet high. And there's a, I don't know if I have a picture of it, but there's a, um, there's a clean room on top of this, you know, and this was made for launching classified satellites. So it's a, a very interesting thing. And then, as I said, then a storm came and we had to close everything up and save it and, and, you know, run for higher ground. Um, and then we came back and the spacecraft was all covered in, in uh, contamination because the, the clean air system that we hooked it up to, the air, air conditioning system wasn't, wasn't, we didn't count on it. We hooked it up to nitrogen bottles and somehow they spewed stuff all over it when they turned the air conditioning back on. So we had to pull the spacecraft off of here, take it back, clean it up without taking it apart and bring it back to the launch pad. So that was pretty depressing. <laughs> and I was the, you know, I was like, 27 years old and I'm the investigation leader for the contamination, you know, it was pretty, uh, pretty interesting. Um, so got a lot of, got a lot of experience really fast. And then we, we launched the thing and it was, it was just, it was every bit as exciting as you, you would think. And, and what's funny is you see the, you see the people in the control rooms all sitting there talking and saying their thing. Well, what we did was as soon as it launched, we ran outside and saw this view that you see in the upper right. So you never see you never see on TV the people running out of the room or <laughs> running down the stairs to see their rocket go up over the over the over the horizon. But uh, it was really exciting. Can Does that help a little bit, Edward? Can you talk a little bit about like what specific design challenges you're trying to solve while working on that project? Let me think about this one. Well, there's a couple. There's a couple things that are normal, and there's a couple things that are abnormal. So this this spacecraft was built with parts from other spacecraft that that uh, Astrospace had made prior. So that was the idea: is reduce the risk of the of the systems by using things that have been used before. Okay, so the design of each box is really it was pretty straightforward but you can see that this thing's just it's a it's a cube with a bunch of boxes stuck on it, okay but this thing has a payload so there's a camera and there's a there's an antenna that has to unfold there's this is a what's called the mars balloon relay this thing with the white cover is the um laser altimeter so we had sophisticated instruments on top of it so these things were the the magic part of it. Um, the challenges we had, one is the solar array. You see the solar array here? So the solar array is right here. It's all folded up, six panels. And you have to unhook it, unfurl it to, to, 12, to, to this, this shape with all these hinges and stuff. But how do you simulate that on Earth? Because this thing's made to work in zero gravity. So the hinges aren't strong enough to hold it up and just move it around, you know. So what we did was, remember I said I worked in an air bearing factory. 
Well, I said, you guys, why don't we use air bearings on the bottom of this thing and put a hanger over the thing and make it work that way. It'll just work like a skating rink and it'll have zero friction and that'll work. And the, and the mechanic, they had really good mechanical engineers there and they're like, that's a great idea, you know? And so I, I don't think I thought of it first, but it was, it was an area that I had expertise and I said, let's do this. Um, another area that was kind of interesting is you see this antenna, you see it right here. Well, it unfolds halfway during part of the mission and then it unfolds all the way for the later part of the mission. What we did was we ran the antenna and once again, the antenna is too heavy that the boom can't hold it out on the end of the antenna in, in one gravity. You can only do that in space. So we got all the cables on it. It's very complicated cabling. It's just wires, but it's all wrapped up and has to move around. And what they did was they made a, a foam core mock-up of this thing. And then they ran it through all its different, you know, articulations because it, it couldn't just point anywhere. It had limitations. So what they found was that the way the design of it was, it, it couldn't move. It's kind of like your wrist couldn't move as far to the right as you wanted it to. So it couldn't move through the entire, um, you know, range of motion. And what that means, this is systems engineering. It's like, who cares? Well, it turns out there's a reason that it had to move through that because that means at this part of the season, because you go through seasons on Mars, the sun is over there instead of over here, or Earth is over here, and we can't communicate to Earth because my I can't move the antenna far enough. So we're going to have lower communications during this part of the mapping orbit. So we had to go back, and I was like the contract guy, so we had to go back and say, all right, so we're going to have to sacrifice this percent of the mission or have lower data rates during this percent of the mission. What does that mean? You know, And we had to go through and update the requirements and talk to the science people and everybody was mad and you know it's, you have to kind of work through this stuff but that's an example of a technical issue that comes up late in the game there's another one that came up really late um hold on one second another one that came up really late which was really unfortunate is we had um you can see these these shields over the motors these are there's four big rocket engines on the bottom and we put shields over them. We had these consultants come in late in the game and they said, your shields are gonna, you know, your, your, your engines are gonna spew contamination all over. So you need these shields to, to cover that up. And then they also told us to not pressurize the propulsion system until we got to Mars. So we had to go back and analyze all that. Well, it turns out that caused the loss of the mission because if they'd open up those valves, the propulsion system would have been working, you know, four days after launch or not working four days after launch. But what happened is, is over time with all the thermal changes in the spacecraft, that fuel and oxidizer leaked up above these check valves that were in there. And when they pressurized the system just before arrival at Mars, it basically blew open the propulsion system and lost the mission. So that was bad. That was a really bad decision that I was not, I was against that, but I, I wasn't in a place to tell them no. But uh, anyways, that does that help? That's, that's the kind of things that you run into because the design was pretty well. The lesson there is fly the mission as you designed it. Don't, don't, don't listen to somebody coming in late in the game who hasn't been there the whole time to tell you what to do. You know, stay, stick with your design intent and, uh, and, and you'll be better off. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, one other thing I want to mention, because I didn't, like I said, my charts got a little scrambled. Um, I, I'm also, um, I'm on the board of uh, the Aerospace Engineering Department at University of Illinois, the um, Alumni Advisory Board. So, you know, I, I've been out of aerospace for 20 years, but I, you know, I'm still connected to the academic side of things. And then through that, you know, you, you, get, you keep pretty current on what's going on in the industry. So that's been a really interesting uh, experience and it helps me understand kind of what you guys are going through as you're as you're applying to to college. Could you talk about your experience um, from working with so many companies and kind of what you've learned along the way? Yeah, you know it, it's interesting because with with the I, I made I've got kind of one liner for each of them. So um, let's see. You know, all the companies are fairly different, but JPL was my first job. Um, 
I'd say it's like the smartest, smartest people in the world. That's not always good, but they're, you know, they're really, really good engineering organization. They can do anything, you know, they, it, 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 you know, if you say go to, go to Europa and put a submarine under the ice, you know, or on the moon of, of Jupiter, well, then they'll do it. You know, if you want to make a helicopter and go to Mars, we'll do it. You know, I've been to other companies and you'll say, well, let's do this. And they'll say, well, I don't know how to do that. And I go, okay, well, then you put in the schedule, you know, the first six weeks, figure out what you're doing, <laughs> make a plan. And some people just don't think that way, but the JPL folks, no matter what you put in front of them, they'll, they'll make it happen. So that's what I learned there. And I used to, I used to take minutes. You would think this was a lowly job, but I would take minutes for the meetings. And so I would sit in the meeting, I would listen. I didn't understand half of what these guys were talking about. And then I would call them up and say, you know, I'm writing the minutes. I can't figure out what this part you were talking about. And they'd say, come up to my office and we'll talk about it. And then I would sit there for an hour or two with these, you know, experts of the, of the world and they would teach me stuff, you know, and they just love to tell stories and they give me papers. And, you know, I learned so much just by being in that position with, with the best people in the world in the aerospace world. Um, so that was my JPL learning. Lockheed Martin, um, so at JPL, I launched one spacecraft in eight years. At, at Lockheed Martin, I was there for four years, we probably launched eight spacecraft. So the pace of, and now I wasn't involved in each one of them as much, but I owned the parts and the software and stuff like that. So you got experience faster. And the other thing is the engineers there were really good. They were not the they were not the Caltech engineers and the MIT engineers and all the big name engineers. They were they were from Rutgers and you know um, Stevens College and you know different places in, in the East Coast. They were really good engineers and they you know I, I was really impressed. And they also had what I would call a change control process, which sounds boring, but everybody knew how to do it, and that had re repercussions later in my career. Um, at GE, I guess I would say what I learned there was management, leadership, organizational awareness kind of stuff, and also global outlook. So I started to travel a lot more, went to Japan, went to China, went to India, um, and GE is a truly global company. So you work with people in all those countries. And you have to realize over my career, when, when companies first went overseas, they would basically they would put expats there and they would manage them locally now china has its own leadership teams india has its own leadership teams you know all the all the various countries are basically self-managed as divisions but it takes time and expertise to help them grow into that um so that was the, that was a big thing with ge <clears throat> baxter baxter similarly has a very global business it's a much more people-oriented business than a things-oriented business. So I had to learn how to operate in that environment. Um, and what I found at Baxter is there's like different needs for different divisions. They have very uh, parochial interests. So the, the people in Brazil would be, you know, making products for Brazil, you know, and we're trying to make a product that works for the whole world. And they keep making that one product in Brazil, you know, because one doctor said that he wants it. So, <laughs> you know, that's a different mindset, but there's a lot of businesses that work that way. And then the last thing, cardiac science. So, um, so what I learned there is a very small company. And what I learned is most important amongst a leadership team there is, is trust. And this is really weird, but you know, you've got to trust the people you're with and they have to trust you. And it's probably not as, well, it's, it's always important, but especially when you get into leadership roles, we had very hard jobs and we had very big challenges and we were all really committed to win and we really trusted each other. And I think I felt that, I felt that at JPL too, there's a lot of trust. Um, so just, you know, the fundamentals like that are really, really important. Um, and, and if you're in a company and it doesn't feel right or you don't feel trusted, um, then, then maybe you ought to go look at it for another company because that's an important, you know, everybody talks about culture, but um, you know it when you see it.
and it's really uncomfortable when you don't see it. <laughs> so. All right, any other questions? Uh, yeah, I just had a quick final question. I was wondering if you could talk quickly about whether like travel is really common in the aerospace engineering industry or if that was just unique to your career. It depends and it's changing. It depends on where you'd be in the aerospace industry. So when I was at Astrospace in New Jersey, um, commercial satellites, I don't have a chart on it right here, but we would buy, we would buy thrusters from Germany. We would buy uh, earth sensors from Japan. We did a new development with, uh, who was it? Um, Mitsubishi. Um, so, so yeah, travel, travel's fairly common in aerospace, except if you're in super classified stuff. So if you're, and I, I never was, but if you were in classified stuff, they tend to not want you traveling to other countries just because it's a security risk that, you know, somebody would, you know, pump you for information. But, um, but yeah, it's fairly global industry. There's a lot of European involvement. The, the guys who would launch satellites would go to, they, we launched out of Russia, China, French Guiana, and Cape Canaveral. And if that isn't about the weirdest four places in the world, you know, I don't know what it is, but um, so yeah, travels, travels a part of it. Uh, you don't have to, but if you're, if you're in the, you know, business management and, you know, that area, you're probably going to travel. There's also a lot of U.S. travel. So when I was at JPL, um, I traveled within the states a lot. I went to almost every NASA center, and I went to a lot of Air Force and uh, university research places. And that was really cool because I was like, I'm like 25 years old, and I'm like the guy from JPL, you know. So it was it was really fun. Um, and I, I, you know, when you go to Washington headquarters and meetings and stuff, so it was, it was, I really enjoy travel and, and, uh, and it's been a, it's been a part of my career and I get antsy when I can't travel. I think we have time for one more question. So we typically like to ask all of our speakers on, um, you know, what traits do you think makes a uh, first successful engineer? What traits? Um, it helps, it really helps to love what you're doing, okay? So, you know, there's a kind of a, a silly quote that says, if you love what you do, then you never work a day in your life, right? Well, I worked a lot of days, I worked really hard, um, but it helps to love what you're doing. And, and in almost every role I've had, I, I uh, you know, there's hard times, especially when you're trying to, you know, get something FDA approved or something like that. But, you know, look at these pictures from 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 uh, Cape Canaveral. You know, it's like I still I still get goosebumps when I look at this stuff because it was so much fun. And um, the people I were, was with were really fun and supportive and they're they're friends to this day. So you got to love what you do. Um, and I think it takes an interest in, in, in science and engineering, you know, but the other thing is you could be in aerospace and not be an engineer. You could be a, you could be a public relations person. You could be a human resources person. You could be, a, um, you know, a support person for any area of the, you, you could be a project management, you know, person. Um, you know, there's lots of different roles that aren't necessarily the aerospace engineering by themselves. So, um, you know, when I talk to people and say, you know, they say, well, what do I want to do when I get out of college? I start with, you have to assume that you're going to have a choice of places. You don't assume you're just going to get whatever job you're going to get because you guys have got a much better, you know, background than that. So you start with what kind of industry do you want to be in and where do you want to live? You know, I, I wanted to go out West and live in California. Um, some people want to stay in the Chicago area, you know, I mean, th those basic decision points will help you decide what you want to do. Um, and then what I haven't even talked about, I don't know if I'm answering the question, but it's, it's all about curiosity, liking to solve problems and having some technical knowledge and, um, and interest. Um, 
But what I haven't talked about is the entrepreneurial companies. So, you know, SpaceX and Blue Origin and some of these, uh, you know, companies making air taxis and stuff. There's a lot of this entrepreneurialism. It's a lot higher risk. Um, it may or may not come to fruition, but th that's fun stuff too. So it, it just kind of depends on whether your personality type fits, you, you know. Yeah, that makes and, sense. you know, I didn't, I didn't do this till many years into my career, but you can, you can do personality uh, profiles like Myers-Briggs and things like that. That'll, that'll give you some idea of what kind of tendencies you have in your personality. And then those, those sort of lead into different career paths. Anything else? I've got time if you got, if you want more questions. I think if we don't have anyone else with any questions, I think we'll wrap it up and say, thank you so much for your time, Mr. Penn. Um, it was very informative and interesting. Um, so yeah, thank you. Oh, we have one more question. <clears throat> oh, the, the photo on LinkedIn? Is that the question? Yeah. Oh, on the icy thing. Okay, so, so um, when I was at Cardiac Science, we, this company sold in August of 2019. And as soon as the company sold, they basically laid off all the senior leadership, including myself, which is what we expected. So that was okay. And so I, I, had, I had previously planned to go to Antarctica just to see Antarctica and then also to scuba dive there. Cause I know these guys who are super tech divers and they take people there to dive. So um, right after the company was sold, I called this guy up and said, Hey, are you guys going to, to Antarctica this year? He said, yes, we are. And I've got a spot available. <laughs> so I went on this uh, three week trip to Antarctica and we scuba dived there. And, and the day that you see, we, we dove on an iceberg and then we all were on these, um, on these boats, you know, the, the Zodiacs. We got on an iceberg and did a group photo on it, like our own mini iceberg. So that's what that picture is. It was a beautiful day. It was sunny, it was warm. And it's like kids on, on Christmas day when you get a bunch of middle-aged men and women on an iceberg on their own. <laughs> It was really fun. So that's what that picture is. That's my fun picture. So can I send a link to my LinkedIn? Yeah, I'll do that. Just I'll, I'll do that, but I can't do it now because I'm not like network properly. But um, just Google Thomas Penn Milwaukee. I think you'll find me. Uh, we will also send a link to your LinkedIn in our event follow-up for all of our participants. Yeah. And if, if anybody has questions, I'm happy to follow up by email or phone call or whatever. I do a lot of networking with high school and, uh, and college students. So I'm, I'm happy to, uh, you know, stay in touch and, and help you out if I can. All right, with that, we will conclude this event. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Penn, and thank you everyone else, everyone else for joining. Thank you, good questions, thank you very and it was much. fun. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you for your time. All righty. <clears throat> Have a great weekend. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye.